This is Franklin Rye, and welcome back to Political Spirits. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, let's talk about a recent example of what could probably best be called left-wing lunacy. Those are proposals from the left that you read about and just shake your head. As is so often the case, this one comes from the university system. And as we've unfortunately become accustomed to, it comes from a university which is considered elite. When enough of these stories accumulate, you just start to wonder, why do we still call these colleges elite? In this case, the college is Columbia University in the Ivy League, and the subject is a five-part inclusive teaching seminar. As reported in thecollegefix.com in an article on December 4, 2018, the seminar will cover topics including, quote, learning through diversity, growth mindset, microaggressions, and implicit bias, trigger warnings, stereotype threat, and inclusive assessments. The fourth session is entitled Inclusive Grading and Assessments. The article notes that PJ Media was able to dig up a presentation from the Columbia University Center, which is conducting the seminar, from last year regarding inclusive grading. Check out this eye-opening quote from the presentation. Quote, grades and institutional rankings are currency for a capitalist system that reduces teaching and learning to a mere transaction. Grading is a massive coordinated effort to take humans out of the educational process. So Columbia University is using an opportunity to teach improved grading methodologies as an opportunity to badmouth the, quote, capitalist system, close quote. That strikes me as absurdly hypocritical given the fact that Columbia's existence as a premier university is owed in large part to that very capitalist system. Not long after its founding as King's College, the renamed Columbia College was placed under a private board of trustees. The board was headed by Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of the U.S. and the first secretary of the Treasury. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more prominent example of a capitalist in the early years of the United States government. The board was also headed by John Jay, who likewise was one of the founding fathers and was a member of a wealthy family of merchants. He was a leading participant in the capitalist system which the grading presentation criticizes. It's worth noting some of the contributors and their estates which donated or funded the buildings and other facilities which make up Columbia University. For example, Marcellus Hartley Dodge was an heir of Remington Arms Manufacturing, and he donated Hartley Hall and the fountains on Low Plaza. Lewisone Hall, which originally housed Columbia's School of Mines, was funded in significant part by Adolph Lewisone, a capitalist involved in the mining industry. Pulitzer Hall was funded by Joseph Pulitzer, the famed newspaper magnate. Building after building across the campus shares a similar story. So unless the left-wing activists preaching the ridiculous idea that the act of grading is dehumanizing and skewering it as a product of the capitalist system want to conduct their seminars on park benches somewhere rather than in buildings funded by the very system they skewer, I would suggest they give some serious thought to the hypocrisy of their criticisms. As I say that, though, it occurs to me that even park benches would be in short supply without the tax revenue derived from capitalism, whether directly from the companies themselves or from the employees who they pay and who pay taxes as well. The bulk of the presentation described by PJ Media is focused on the idea of, quote, going gradeless, close quote and letting students grade themselves. And it notes that students like the idea. Well, what a shock! I can guarantee you from looking at self-evaluations in my various jobs over the years as part of determining the actual binding evaluation to be given to those individuals, it's no wonder that a student or an employee would generally prefer a self-evaluation. As a general proposition, the grades we give ourselves typically are higher than the grades others give us. 
Is it any wonder that then that students would prefer to grade themselves? Two things strike me about the proposal for students to grade themselves. The first is that it's just another troubling example of colleges abandoning their mission to prepare students for the working world. I can tell you with complete confidence that I'm not aware of a single instance where a business allows employees to rate themselves and then considers that rating to govern. Of course, there are plenty that ask employees to review and rate themselves and then consider that review and rating when actually preparing the official review and rating for the employee for the year. The second thing that strikes me is that it prompts me to ask the question, why does the far left so often view the world in an unrealistic and idealistic way? Their insistence on doing so was most tragically demonstrated with the rise and catastrophic reign of communism in so many countries in the 20th century. Literally tens of millions of people died because of the failure to recognize that when you remove the profit motive, when you place the ownership of lands and of goods in the hands of the government rather than leaving them in the hands of people who intend to profit, then you cripple the economic engine that drives an economy. Leftists fail to recognize that people are driven by materialism, not altruistic motives, and millions died as a result, from starvation and the brutality of failed regimes trying to maintain control. Self-grading doesn't threaten mass starvation, but it does threaten the viability of the university system which is already subject to increasing questioning as to whether it's effectively serving the needs of the society and the economy which feeds it. Next topic. Environmentalism versus conservationism. An environmentalist believes that, quote, the environment is to be saved, preserved, set aside, protected from human abuse, close quote. A conservationist believes that, quote, the environment is something we use, so we have to conserve it and take care of it so that others can use it in the future, close quote. Those definitions come from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, at uwsp.edu, and they really get to the heart of the difference. As you may know, Republicans or conservatives tend to be conservationist, at least typical Republicans and typical conservatives. Typical Democrats and typical liberals are more likely to be environmentalists. If your goal is to maintain a level of environmental protection while promoting economic development, I don't see how you can view the environmentalist approach as the better one. That's why when someone claims that they want to see the economy improve, and yet also claims that they are an environmentalist, I'm skeptical of their political analysis and opinions. The effort over the last several decades to couch environmental restrictions as some sort of economic stimulus because they'll result in advancement of a new economy based on technological developments to conserve energy or reduce carbon footprint has been an effort to address that conflict. If politicians succeeded in convincing enough of the voting public that the environmental restrictions would in fact spur the economy, then they could pursue the restrictions without losing those in the electorate whose biggest issue, or nearly biggest issue, is the economy. Perhaps the politician who did that most effectively was Barack Obama. But the reality has been that severe environmental restrictions, and those which bolster environmental technologies which cannot survive on their own, do not spur economic growth. And instead, they waste precious tax dollars which could be better spent elsewhere or left in the pockets of the taxpayer. For an interesting commentary on the issue, look to the article at Wired.com, July 30, 2018 edition, by Eric Neiler, entitled, If Germany Can't Quit Coal, Can Anyone Else? The article points out the fact that Germany, which is purportedly committed to cutting greenhouse gas emissions, quote, just can't seem to quit burning coal, close quote. In fact, Germany is mining increasing volumes of lignite, or brown coal. Lignite is the most polluting but easiest to strip mine form of coal. As the article asks, quote, So if super green Germany, with its massive wind and solar farms, advanced technology and industrious mindset, 
can't quit its love affair with coal, can anyone else on the planet? Right now, the answer is a bit muddled, close quote. Meanwhile, the United States, which dropped out of the Paris Climate Accords, has actually reduced its carbon emissions more than many other countries which criticized its departure from those Paris Climate Accords. See, for example, the foxnews.com article by Justin Haskins and H. Sterling Barnett on July 28, 2018, entitled, U.S. Cuts Carbon Emissions More Than Foreign Nations That Criticize Trump Environmental Policies. The article notes that while the U.S. reduced its carbon dioxide emissions by 41.8 million tons from 2016 to 2017, which was its third consecutive year of reducing emissions, emissions in Canada increased by 17 million tons from 2016 to 2017. This occurred notwithstanding Prime Minister Trudeau's criticism of the Trump administration for leaving the Paris Accords, which he described as disheartening and stated he was deeply disappointed. The article points out that Trudeau also stated that, quote, Canada is unwavering in our commitment to fight climate change and support clean economic growth, close quote. He went on, quote, Canadians know we need to take decisive and collective action to tackle the many harsh realities of our changing climate, close quote. His words don't really seem in line with what Canada is actually doing with regard to emissions today, do they? The article labeled him a hypocrite, and I agree. It also points out that China, France, Spain, and dozens of other Paris Climate Accord signatories also increased carbon emissions. The president's action is making more sense with each passing day. Why restrict your freedom and potentially hamstring your economy by signing on to a deal which doesn't produce its intended results, especially when you can do just as well or better without doing it? That's the kind of common sense which he preached on the campaign trail and is one of the key reasons he was elected. So how is America cutting its greenhouse gas emissions? It's doing it by fracking. The use of fracking techniques has resulted in a dramatic increase in the amount of natural gas recovered in the U.S., to the point that since 2009, the U.S. has been the largest producer of natural gas in the world. Just three days ago, the U.S. Geological Survey announced that it had completed its resource assessment of the Texas and New Mexico-Delaware Basin natural gas find and concluded it was the largest oil and natural gas reserve found in history. It consists of 46.3 billion barrels of oil and 20 billion barrels of natural gas. Because natural gas burns cleaner than coal, every one of these fines contributes to America's reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Moreover, those reductions occur without backbreaking environmental regulations and are spurred instead by a favorable business climate and the most reliable economic engine of all the profit motive. The fracking industry and support for it is perhaps the best example I can think of for conservationism. Given the results achieved, why isn't everyone a conservationist? Next topic. The Paris Riots We have all watched with concern the riots that have erupted in Paris over the last four weekends. The so-called Yellow Vest protests were purportedly fueled by anger over diesel fuel taxes intended to reduce carbon emissions as part of an effort to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accords. It's been reported, and the evidence supports, that the core of the Yellow Vests are comprised of individuals from rural areas and small towns in France. In that respect, and the fact that they were originally protesting against fuel taxes prompted by the Paris Climate Accords, there seems to be some similarity with the most devoted base of Donald Trump's support in America. As has been noted in many of the articles regarding the protests, the protesters have more generalized objections to the Macron regime, which go beyond the fuel taxes. 
The objections are financial in that they seem focused on standard of living, the cost of taxes, and objections to large-scale immigration. Once again, there are similarities with, with the issues which drove the election of President Trump. Having said that, it would be easy to overstate the extent to which there are similarities. You can find some captivating and quite informative videos on YouTube showing the protests in Paris and the police response, as well as some of the actions outside of Paris, such as yellow vest protesters taking over toll booths and allowing cars through without paying the toll. For the former, I recommend YouTube videos from Jack Buckby of Rebel Media, and for the latter, I recommend videos from NBC. Those from France 24 are well done as well. One of Jack Buckby's videos makes the point that the looting and burning of shops is being done by anarchists slash Antifa rioters who've joined the mix to take advantage of the situation, rather than by the Yellow Jacket protesters. He points to anarchist graffiti, which he notes is outside all of the looted and burned shops. Could what is happening in France happen in the U.S.? Perhaps. I do believe that at the core of what is motivating the Yellow Jacket protesters, you'll find much of the same motivation as at the core of those who voted for Donald Trump. It is a sense that the elites have let them down, and that the elites do not have their interests in mind. I recently read an article by Steve Hilton on FoxNews.com that comes closer to capturing that feeling at the core of the Trump supporters than I've seen before, and frankly, I've had the same feeling for quite some time. The article appeared on October 30, 2018, and was entitled, quote, Trump and his supporters are being blamed for a climate of rage and hate, but here's the truth, close quote. The most insightful part of the article notes that the present anger predates the Trump campaign and goes back at least 10 years. Quote, in 2008, you saw the elite bail themselves out while working people paid the price for their recklessness and incompetence, and you saw a new tone enter our politics, close quote. Hilton points out that before 2008, presidents, quote, made it clear they loved America and loved Americans, all Americans. But then we saw something new. A cultural elitism came in. Condescension, even contempt, close quote. He points to Barack Obama stating, quote, quote, they get bitter and they cling to guns or religion, close quote. And to Michelle Obama stating that, quote, for the first time in my adult lifetime, I'm really proud of my country, close quote. And to Joe Biden stating recently at a charity dinner that, quote, they, not you, have an ally in the White House. This time they have an ally. They are a small percentage of American people, virulent people, some of them the dregs of society, close quote. And of course, he references Hillary Clinton's infamous gaffe that was so devastating to her campaign. Quote, you could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, close quote. Hilton is absolutely correct when he points out that, quote, working Americans have started to realize that the people at the top, the politicians and CEOs and tech geniuses and the Hollywood types, they really do look down their noses at them for how they live, for what they eat, what they watch, the fact that they go to church, and, of course, their political views, close quote. He's correct as well when he points out that those elites have, quote, shown no compassion for the casualties of, of globalization, automation, centralization, and uncontrolled immigration, close quote, and that those ideas, quote, have destroyed people's jobs, devastated their families and communities, and then in 2016, when they cry out for help, you call them deplorable, close quote. Steve Hilton then makes a plea to his fellow members of the elite, what he calls the, quote, liberal elite and the never-Trump elite. Start practicing the tolerance you preach. Show some empathy and respect for your fellow Americans. Love thy neighbor. Yes, even the ones who support President Trump and watch Fox News. Close quote. Extremely well said. I don't think that rioting on the level of what has broken out in Paris will break out in the U.S. 
France in general, and Paris in particular, have a long history of huge and destructive politically motivated riots. We've of course had outbreaks in the U.S., most notably in the 60s related to the Vietnam War. But our history in that respect is not as extensive as France's. Moreover, the U.S., after the Civil War, just tends to find a way to address its divisions and moderate itself before things boil over. In this instance, the way we need to moderate ourselves is to look inward. Those who are looking down their noses at their fellow Americans, and as I noted in prior podcasts, those doing the looking down tend to be on the left, need to look inward and address their own arrogance and hypocrisy. You can't preach diversity and inclusion when what you mean by that is a diverse selection of people who agree with you. Typically, when we feel like we're superior to others, if we really take a close look at it, we find that we're not. I remember as a young man, I just graduated from college, and over the summer before moving on to graduate school, I chose to take a job at a construction site because it paid surprisingly well. I'd never worked in that environment before, and after hours of back-breaking labor in the southern heat, lunch break came. We all sat down at picnic tables under a pavilion outside the church onto which we were building an addition. I felt confident that none of my fellow laborers was a college graduate, and I expected that the assistant supervisor was not either, and I even thought the supervisor was probably not as well. I remember the thoughts running through my head, predicting the likely topics of conversation over lunch. Would they talk about baseball scores, bass fishing, how much they had to pay for a set of tires, Ford versus Chevy, a recent trip to a strip club? I wasn't sure, but the one thing I was confident of is that it wouldn't be anything complex or sophisticated. After all, I was a college graduate and moving on to graduate school, and they were not. So I sat down and started unwrapping my sandwich, curious to see what the topics would be that the supervisor and assistant supervisor would bring up. Imagine my surprise when the first things out of their mouths were, So, what do you think the Fed's going to announce about interest rates this week? I was flabbergasted. I was just a young punk, totally unaware of the realities of life outside of college. And those realities are that when you're raising families, as that supervisor and assistant supervisor were, the economy and the markets and the actions of the Fed are just as important, frankly more important to you, than to any college graduate full of himself because he's moving on to grad school. Every spot under that pavilion was full, and not one of the persons there was deserving of being labeled a deplorable, and only one was deserving of being labeled conceited or full of himself. I learned from that experience, and I've grown more since then. I have confidence in our country, and if our elites learn from what we are experiencing and the world is experiencing, we will avoid what is happening in France. Only time will tell. Please make sure that you don't avoid the experience of this podcast. Please join me for the next episode next week. Until then, be sure to tell your friends about political spirits. And follow me on Twitter at Franklin Rye. Like me on Facebook at Political Spirits. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.